Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let us wait a while for the slides to come on. Thank you. Now, I'm pleased to speak to you today about eco-cities, whether they are fat or sustainable option. And I'll do so with reference to the Sino-Singapore Tianjin eco-city, which we are developing. And I think it provides a real-life example against which we can draw some useful conclusions. Now, firstly, let me briefly recall the evolution of eco-cities and sustainable development, a point that Mr. Nicholas Yu also mentioned earlier. Now, the, the term sustainable development first became popular um, and was defined in 1987 by the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development. Coincidentally, in the same year, Richard Register, who coined the term eco-city around 1979, he was one of the people in California, uh, who Mr. Yu talked about, first used this term in the title of his book, Eco-City Berkeley. The point I'm making is the discussion on eco-cities is as long as the discussion is as old, if not older, than the discussion on sustainable development itself. The eco-city is therefore not a new concept. And if it is a fad, it is one that has been with us for a very long time. Unfortunately, for the two decades thereafter, there was limited success in turning the concept of eco-cities into a viable uh, proposition. The world was increasingly plagued by environmental degradation and climate change. By 2008, more than half the world's population lived in towns and cities. The need for sustainable cities had therefore become ever more pressing, and governments around the world were looking for solutions to the sustainability challenges facing cities. This is the backdrop against which the Tianjin eco-city came into existence. In April 2007, Singapore's then senior minister, Goh Chok Tong, proposed to Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao that the two countries jointly build an eco-city. Premier Wen warmly welcomed the proposal immediately. Seven months later, the prime ministers of the two countries signed the framework agreement to jointly build the Sino-Singapore eco-city in the port city of Tianjin, which is less than an hour by train from Beijing. One of the contradictions in some so-called eco-developments around the world is the destruction of lush farmland and fragile ecosystems in the name of building an eco-city. However, this is not a problem for the Tianjin eco-city. Let me show you why. In 2008, this was the site of the eco-city. It comprised non-arable land, deserted salt farms, and polluted water. There was nothing inherently eco about this site. In fact, this was one of the conditions set by the Chinese government, that the eco-city must be built on non-farm land that's lacking in fresh water. While this imposes considerable challenges on its development, it also ensures that whatever we build here can be replicated elsewhere. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to the red and white bridge, which gives you a frame of reference as we switch to the next slide. Today, the wasteland of the past has been replaced by an emerging city with green buildings, nicely landscaped streets and cycling paths, wind turbines and solar panels to tap renewable energy. There are green private homes, there is also high-quality public housing, which was developed with reference to the experience of the Singapore Housing and Development Board in public housing in Singapore. There are also different business and industrial parks to provide economic vibrancy for the city and jobs for the residents. The development of the eco-city is guided by two main sets of principles, what we call the three capabilities and the three harmonies. Now, the three capabilities require that the eco-city must be practical, scalable, and replicable. This means that the solutions we implement here must be affordable and can be replicated in other cities in China, in Asia, and elsewhere. The three harmonies are conceptually similar to the three pillars of sustainable development. There are three aspects of sustainability, harmony between people and the environment, harmony between people and economy, and finally, harmony between people and people. Various levels of the two governments are involved in the project. It is overseen by a joint steering council chaired by the deputy prime ministers of the two countries. Below this, there are committees involving ministers and officials who meet regularly to guide the city's development. Singapore ministries and agencies such as uh, the Ministry of National Development, HDB, URA, and so on, are actively involved in the development of the Tianjin eco-city. While this is a government-to-government -government project, it is driven on a commercial basis by the private sector, which is core to ensuring that this project is practical and replicable. My company, SS Tech, is a 50-50 joint venture between the Singapore consortium led by the Capital Group, which contributes the capital, and the Chinese consortium, which contributes the land. And we are the master developer of the Tianjin EcoCity. Our goal is to complete the 30 square kilometer EcoCity over a 10 to 15 year time frame with a long-term vision of supporting a population of around 350,000 people. In the initial phase, we are working on an approximately three square kilometer startup area which is scheduled to be completed by the end of next year. 
On the screen, you can see a photo of the startup area taken about a month ago. People sometimes ask, because there are so many different around, uh, developments around the world that profess to be green, what is so eco about the Tianjin Eco City? Let me highlight some of the ways that we are different from other projects. When talking about eco cities, experts often point to criteria such as those, seen, uh, those shown on the slide. Was it built at the expense of lush ecosystems? Is this a city which is car friendly or pedestrian friendly? Are there many green buildings? Does it tap renewable energy? I'm pleased to say that the Tianjin Eco City meets the criteria imposed by the experts. For a start, a green city begins with green master planning. The master planning of the Tianjin Eco City was jointly done by experts from China and Singapore and combines the ideas and best practices on both sides. The Eco City was designed to encourage walkability. The basic building block is an eco cell, roughly 400 meters by 400 meters, with community walkways cutting through them, thus allowing residents to walk through the blocks instead of having to walk around them. There is also a 12 kilometer long linear park, or what we call the Eco Valley, running through the Eco City and connecting all its major centers and nodes. For Singaporeans, one can think it's somewhat like an expanded park connector. The Eco City will also have a tram line running along it. It therefore is a key feature promoting walking, cycling, and the use of public transport. The Eco City is envisaged to be a compact, mixed use development. Let us zoom into one corner of the startup area to illustrate this point. For example, the Eco Business Park at the bottom of the picture is located adjacent to a public housing estate as well as private condominiums, thus ensuring that a mix of employees can live in close proximity to their workplace. There are also commercial centres, schools and neighbourhood centres all located nearby. Most of one's daily needs can therefore be met within walking distance. This is also a high-density development which optimises the use of land, something of particular importance to countries like China with the large populations. We also have objective measures of what we are trying to achieve. Some eco-cities are as green as they profess to be. In contrast, the Tianjin eco-city has a set of 22 quantitative and four qualitative key performance indicators, or KPIs, which include various aspects of sustainable development. These were jointly developed by experts from China and Singapore. Committing to a set of KPIs up front allows the progress of the eco-city to be measured and compels both governments and private sectors to find effective and practical solutions to meet these targets. For example, one of the KPIs is 100% green buildings. China and Singapore jointly developed a green building evaluation standard for the Tianjin Eco City. This combines the best features of China's Green Star and Singapore's Green Mark systems. Whereas the attainment of green building standards in many other places is voluntary, in the Tianjin Eco City, all buildings must meet the GBES requirement. Other KPIs include 20% renewable energy utilization, which we achieve through solar PV, sol solar thermal collectors, wind turbines, and ground source heat pumps, 90% green trips within the eco-city, 100% portable water, at least 50% water from non-traditional sources, such as rainwater harvesting, 20% public housing, and so on. Some may ask why include public housing as a KPI for an eco-city? The answer is that we see sustainable development not just being green, but about building sustainable communities. The eco-city is therefore not an exclusive village comprising expensive eco-friendly houses, but a city where there are green homes for all segments of society. Putting all this together, what we are trying to create is a high-quality, sustainable city where residents can work, live, play and learn, all in a resource-efficient, environmentally friendly and socially harmonious way. This, in a nutshell, is the eco-city that we are building in Tianjin. Someone might ask, well, all this sounds good, but does the eco-city model work? Is this a sustainable option? To answer this question, I think it's useful to consider whether the market supports what we are doing. Are home buyers and investors convinced by our value proposition? What do the international community and media and experts like yourself think of our model? In this regard, I'm pleased to say that our results thus far have been fairly promising. In the past three years, renowned international developers such as Capo Land from Singapore, Mitsui Fudosan from Japan, and Samsung from Korea have committed to develop green homes in the eco-city. And the green homes which have been built thus far have been selling well. So far, despite China's property market cooling measures in the past two years, the eco-city has sold nearly 5,000 homes. This shows that home buyers are increasingly receptive towards eco-developments and are prepared to pay a bit more for green homes. 
Apart from developers, the EcoCity has also attracted large MNCs such as Philips, Hitachi, Capo, and SD Engineering. As this is a high-profile government-to-government project, many companies see this as an effective platform to provide green products, services, and solutions, or to conduct research and development and test bidding of their products. International organizations and international media have also given the Tianjin EcoCity positive reviews. International media such as CNN, BBC, and New York Times have reported favorably on what we are trying to do. Two weeks ago, I was also invited to the Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development in Brazil, where we gave a presentation on the Tianjin EcoCity as a model for sustainable development, especially for developing countries. Of course, in the course of developing an EcoCity, there are many challenges we have to confront and trade-offs that need to be made. For example, we often have to balance between idealism and pragmatism. Do we go for a lofty and perhaps costly environmental ideal? Or what is viable right here, right now? Thus, for instance, a reporter once asked me, will you ban cars in the eco-city? My answer is no. Given the aspirations of the Chinese people, we do not think that it will be practical to ban cars at this stage of China's development. But what we'll do is to make it convenient for residents to use other means of transport, especially public transport, thus increasing the likelihood that they will not resort to using private cars. This is the kind of practical approach we are taking. A lot of what we do is not very costly or radical, but if it is done across the board in many cities, I believe the net environmental impact can be very large. Second, there would always be different groups that pursue different goals. The central and local governments, the private sector, civil society, residents, and so on. In developing an eco-city, one would always have to try to balance and align these different goals. So far, the Tianjin Eco Cities model of a government-led project, driven on a commercial basis, provides what I think is a good platform for us to try to align these different objectives. Third, the development of an eco city is in itself an important and valuable goal, but it is not the whole picture. We also need to encourage residents to adopt eco lifestyles, to change their living habits, rely more on public transport, practice more recycling, and so on. In the early stages of the EcoCities development, our focus was quite naturally more on hardware, from planning to building an ecologically friendly city. As we move to the next stage and welcome residents, and we have begun welcoming residents since the start of this year, increasing attention would have to be paid to software to build a harmonious, environmentally conscious society. And I think this is an area where Singapore and China would need to continue to work closely together in the next phase of the development of the EcoCity. This brings me back to the question posed at the start of my presentation. Are eco-cities a fair or a sustainable option? My view is that whatever name we give to such cities, at its core, what we're trying to do is to build cities that are more ecologically friendly, economically sustainable, and socially harmonious. I think the pursuit of such goals is not a passing fad, but goals which governments and various organizations have been pursuing for years. If the concept of building eco-cities has suddenly become extremely popular, such that it can be considered a fad, then I think this is a good fad. In time to come, as mankind continues to urbanize, I believe that ecologically friendly cities would increasingly be seen not only as one sustainable option, but really as a standard against which all cities uh, should aspire to. Finally, to conclude, the logo of my company, SS Tech, is a seed. It represents the idea of an eco-city that the two governments planted in 2007. Today, the city is beginning to take shape, and we are beginning to see the idea of eco-city spreading to other parts of China. In time to come, I believe that the Tianjin eco-city will not just be one green city, but one green city in a forest of green cities. And some of these new eco-developments may replicate only a few of our ideas. Others may surpass us and become bigger or greener cities. To the extent that the Tianjin EcoCity has helped to promote the concept that EcoCities are viable and attractive propositions, I think we would have done our part to promote sustainable development. Thank you very much.